God's people of the Old Testament had their enemies because they were God's people. And the Lord's church, God's people today, a New Testament institution, has its enemies because they are God's people. You don't have to read far into the Bible, and especially the New Testament, to find warning after warning and even examples of where God's people are hated because they live like God wants them to live. They teach what God wants them to teach. And they defend what God wants them to defend. That is, they are striving to live like Jesus Christ. One of the things that we need to remember is that those enemies someday will no longer be troubling the Lord's faithful and we shall see them no more. I want to go to the Old Testament to emphasize that very point in this sermon. You'll remember that the Israelites, God's chosen people, had promised, God had promised to be with them. And Moses, a type of Christ, as Israel, fleshly Israel, was a type of the Lord's church, Moses made sure that the people understood their relationship with God, who had delivered them from bondage in Egypt, in the mighty hand, to use Old Testament terminology. And in the book of Deuteronomy, that word means a restatement of the law. Just before Moses is taken up on Mount Nebo and there he dies and God buries him and no man knows where his grave is, we find this said, Moses is the one who is addressing God's people, fleshly Israel, the type of the Lord's church. Deuteronomy 4, verses 39 and 40. Know therefore this day, and lay it to thy heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. And thou shalt keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. Again, that's Deuteronomy 4, 39 and 40. Now God said to Moses in Deuteronomy 5, 29, Concerning fleshly Israel, oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. The children of Israel were in Egyptian captivity, as we all know, and while therein, they were at the very mercy of their Egyptian taskmasters. But then, over a period of time, after seeing God unleash the ten plagues upon Egypt, we learned that the Pharaoh, though reluctantly, let the Israelites start their departure from Egypt. But Pharaoh quickly changed his mind. And the scripture says in Exodus 14, 6 through 7, he took 600 chosen chariots to pursue the Israelites. Now that would be like taking, for our day and time, in military terms, 600 tanks or something like that. He meant to bring them back one way or the other. 
But in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10, we learn, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lift up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. If they had been what they ought to have been, they would have uh, said to themselves, as we did as spiritual Israel a moment ago in our worship, anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. And that it wouldn't be impossible for them to fear because who's on their side? Who have they witnessed offer those plagues against Egypt? And in every plague there was the overthrow of an Egyptian god. Well, of course, God was on their side. And as the New Testament writer Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? <coughs> Did you begin to see even this lesson come out for spiritual Israel today, the church? But it was at this time that Moses told the people that there was a time coming when they would never again see their Egyptian enemies. Exodus 14, verse 13. You get a picture of that in Paul's writing to Thessalonians as he gives comfort to the persecuted brethren, our brethren of almost 2,000 years ago, members of the Lord's church. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and the glory of his power. Thus, there's a great lesson in the Old Testament here, as there are so many lessons that help us as children of God walk the straight and narrow way of truth of New Testament authority. So may we as members of the church of our Lord learn from this incident the great lessons that are contained in it. And there are more than one. The general lesson we've mentioned. But it's important to understand that firstly at least, that great changes may occur very quickly. Great changes may occur very quickly. The Egyptians were strongly pressing the Israelites one moment, had them afraid. They were crying out. Their faith actually was proven to be weak. But the next moment, what was the situation? with the Egyptians as they sought to catch up to the Israelites returned in the bondage. They were overwhelmed by the Red Sea. Now to escape the Egyptians, the scripture says the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left, Exodus 14, 22. Paul would speak of that when he wrote to the Corinthians. And he talked about that they are all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Well, baptism is an immersion, isn't it? Well, I see water on one side of them. I see water on the other side of them. But what's above them? Well, if you go back and read the text, you'll see it was a great cloud. And as far as I know, a cloud is water vapor. And as Moses was a type of Christ in Israel, a type of the church, and the Holy Spirit through Paul, the same Holy Spirit that inspired Moses, said that they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So there's further explanation of just when you're freed from bondage to sin today. They were freed from that bondage and they saw the Egyptians no more who were the cause of their bondage when they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. After God's people were safe, that's important, 
made safe. They were saved from Egypt. Moses was told to stretch forth his hand over the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Even all the hosts, the Pharaoh, that went in after them into the sea, there remained not so much as one of them. Exodus 14, 28. When you read that, do you just read that as a history of what happened? Or do you read it as that which helps people today understand our Savior, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6, and His salvation for us from sin. For all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They're in bondage to sin. By that sin, they're separated from God. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So here so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the Lord established his church and people became members of it, we have it pictured as to exactly what point people are freed from bondage to sin. So the warning is as clear, I think, clear today to those who are in rebellion to God and refuse to obey him. And you know, the, the inspired Hebrews writer records, Take heed, brethren, lest haply there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God, as the American Standard puts it. But exhort one another daily or day by day, so long as it's called today. In other words, as long as you're alive today, you're subject to whatever life has to offer. And in the case of being Christians, they were reminding one another what we need to know about living righteous. Lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 13. Sin may and oftentimes does appear to be very profitable, very pleasurable. But what's God in your life? It should be the truth of God. And the truth of God means that sin is the only thing that separates you from God. And if you die and forgiven, still in bondage to it, then there's no hope for you. The psalmist was perplexed at the wicked people's ability to prosper until he went into the sanctuary of God and considered the latter end. Surely thou settest them in slippery places. Thou castest them down to destruction. Psalm 73, 17 through 18. That's true of everybody outside of Christ or those who apostatize. And they're all back in captivity to sin. Separated from God. Oh, it may look so good. They may look like they don't have a worry in the world. They may look like they're just happy as larks. But the truth says otherwise. And if I'm to really see this world as God sees it and live in it like God wants me to, I must know the truth. The truth will set you free. John 8, 32. One moment, everything can appear to be well. And the next moment, one will find his sweet feet swept out from under him. And he'll face judgment. It may seem like life is a long time, but when you've lived it a while, you realize more and more what James had to say, that life's like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. Well, that's one point that we get from this account. But there's another one. Our opportunities may suddenly vanish. We know that the Egyptians witnessed the great power of Almighty God. They experienced it. The plagues were for the purpose of making believers of Pharaoh and his people. They should have said, well, then God is behind all of this. There's but one true and living God. And Moses obviously is a spokesman of God. 
And he said, let my people go and I will cooperate and let them go. And I will equip them so that they can go do what God has called them to do. But of course he didn't, did he? Sadly, that's been the case with the majority of mankind all along. You see what you want to see. Do you remember when Peter and John healed the man lame from birth, the beautiful gate of the temple, Solomon's porch? You remember after quite some goings on, we get a picture of the private council of the chief priests and others. And they're talking among themselves. I've often wondered, how do we get that? How do we know what they said? But God's dealing with it, so he lets us know. They said that a notable miracle hath been done. We cannot deny it. Now think about what that implies. I've said many times a notable miracle. My, any miracle is a notable miracle to me. But here was a man everybody knew. And they knew he was lame from birth and he was over 40 years old. And all of a sudden, he's at the gate begging. And next thing you know, he's up jumping around all over the place. What is the situation? It's what we want to believe. If you don't want to believe it, you're not. Well, does that mean we don't have adequate evidence and credible witness to prove our case when we reason correctly? No. Eve had that. But she still sinned because she was deceived. What does that mean to be deceived? Well, you believe and obey the truth and you're right with God. You believe and obey a lie and you sin. What makes us do that? We see what we want to see. Pride may make us not be able to admit something. Many, many years ago in visiting with the late brother Guy in Woods, and I may have related this in times past, and this would go back into the late 30s, possibly early 40s. He was in a gospel meeting out in West Texas. Five years later, he came back and he was, or I actually I have it right backwards, he was in a debate. And he came back five years later for a gospel meeting. And there was a man who came to the meeting. And he came up to Brother Woods, and Brother Woods was telling me this. And he told Brother Woods he wanted to obey the gospel. He responded to the invitation of the words. And they baptized him. And he was relating this to Brother Woods. He said, you know, Brother Woods, I was convinced of the plan of salvation five years ago in that debate you had that baptism was necessary for salvation. But he said, my family, all the way back as far as I know, have all been Baptist. And I was involved very much in the Baptist church. And though I was intellectually convinced by the right division of the word that baptism was foreign to in order to the remission, forgiveness of sins, to the believing and repentant person, I just could not act upon it because of what I would get into with my family. But when you came back from this meeting, I had labored with that all these years, knowing it's what the Bible said, and I read it and read it and read it. I just decided it wasn't worth my soul to make peace with everybody else and not make peace with God on his own terms. And I knew exactly what the New Testament of Jesus Christ said as to what one must believe and do to become a Christian. Now that's not just a preacher's story. But I'm convinced from having associated with a lot of preachers over the years and others that that kind of thing happened in a lot of places. Sometimes our preachers were far more bold than we are nowadays and made points in ways we would... Uh, Declined to do today. 
And back in the early days of the Restoration, in the early 1800s, they would baptize a great many people. John Smith, who did not like to be called Raccoon John Smith, but that's how he's come down to us, was a great preacher of that day and time. Campbell said of him, he's the only man I ever saw that a formal education would have ruined as far as his preaching. And he met many people in debate and in preaching gospel meetings. And they were baptizing folks after his preaching one day. And a number of folks were being baptized, and a great many Methodists. And the Methodist preacher, with quite some consternation, was standing on the bank watching a great many of his people, of members of his church, be baptized into Christ for the least of sins. And before he knew it, Smith jumped up out of the water and ran up there and grabbed him and started pulling him down the water. And the fellow said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to baptize you. He said, I don't want to be baptized, and I'm not going to be baptized. I'm going to baptize you anyway. When they got almost down to the edge of the water, the struggle was going on, one pulling one way and one pulling the other. All of a sudden, Smith just let the Methodist preacher go. He stumbled back. And he stood there before that great group of people and said, Now remember that when you baptize those babies. And you have to think for a minute to realize what he's saying. They had no choice in the matter. And I don't know of a baby that would choose to have water poured on his head or whatever. And there he was, a grown man, and couldn't see that. Now, sometimes we fail to understand, even today, how we can teach without just being able to quote Scripture, if we would. But we're going to be opposed if we do what God said we ought to do. If we love God with our whole heart, and if we love the souls of men and women, boys and girls who are outside of Christ and lost and are caught up in some false religion, then we may cause them to be very upset with us. But the Egyptians, like so many, not the great majority, were stubborn and would not receive the obvious, though miracles had confirmed that what Moses said was so. Sadly, that was the case with the Israelites. In so many cases. Now the Apostle Paul said in the New Testament, Behold, now is acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6 2. What is our point? Well, opportunities can very quickly vanish. So many people put off until tomorrow what they know they should do today. Now think with me. You have no, listen, you have no more assurance that tomorrow will come than you do of going back to yesterday. Well, you say, I can't go back to yesterday. You don't know whether you'll go to tomorrow. There may not be a tomorrow. You have today, the Holy Spirit in you is talking about, behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the now is accepted time. Tomorrow may never come. Someday it will not come. The apostles of the Gentiles also made it clear that the invisible things since, uh, of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, I'm not going to speak against that. The Holy Spirit said the invisible, him from the, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Well, they are or they aren't, and I don't believe God lied. They're clearly seen. And they're perceived through the things that are made. Even his everlasting power and Godhead, American Standard says divinity, that they may be without excuse. Romans 1.20, that's people that deny the existence of God and do not desire to retain God in their knowledge. I don't know whether Ken and Nancy remember this, but when we were... And that's been quite a few years ago. Uh, we may remember it back then better now than we remember yesterday. I don't know. But we were over in England, and we were in the British Museum. They have a wing of it where they have all sorts of stuff from George III that he had. He was quite an educated fellow. And I was walking down through there separate from them. I don't even think I was walking with Jody. We'd spread out looking at different things. 
And here was a model, looked like it was made out of brass, of our solar system. Now, I know what that implies. It implies design, and it implies a designer, and it implies somebody had the power to put the whole thing together, that is, to follow the design. And yet we look at the real solar system and say there is no God. We can't see design. So how many more opportunities will we have to obey the gospel or be brought to believe in God? the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the scriptures, or to correct a sinful lifestyle because opportunities can vanish so quickly. Third, one's self-confidence can lead to ruin. I believe in a certain kind of self-confidence. If I didn't have a certain kind of self-confidence, I couldn't have done what I've done all my life. And yet there never has been a time that I have stood up before somebody to impart knowledge knowing that I'm to speak the word of God, not what I think. That there wasn't a bit of trepidation because of what I'm doing. To be called a gospel preacher actually means you preach the gospel. Now, can there be people who have more talent in that area than others? Of course. People are better at certain things than other folks are, but you do what you can with what you have to do with, and you put your all and all into it. The Egyptians followed after the Israelites. Trusting in their own fleshly power. In so doing, they rush to the very place of their destruction. Now, they didn't start out at the command of Pharaoh to go destroy themselves. But when they tried to follow the Israelites, that's what happened, because it was only for the Israelites to go through the parted waters of the Red Sea, not for them. They didn't believe in God. They were out to do God's people evil and to rebel against God. That would be like a person today saying, I don't believe in God, I'll be baptized to make my wife happy. Or I don't believe in Christ, but I'll be baptized to make my wife happy. That won't work. The Bible, God's good word, reminds all today to let him that thinketh, he standeth, Take heed lest he fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So there's always that challenging and questioning of oneself in the sense that we check up on ourselves. Have you ever gone to bed at night and you know how when you get in the bed and the lights are out and just before you're trying to go to sleep, did I lock the front door? Joe, did you lock the front door? And usually the answer is, yes, I made sure it was locked. I went by and checked it. <laughs> Turned on the alarm. Okay. Or something like that anyway. But it's good to check up on yourself. I don't care how good a habit you have of locking the front door. It's good to do it. And there are many, many things like that. The Bible emphatically teaches that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Now, it doesn't pay anything else. You break God's law, sins the transgression of the law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, and all you're going to get paid is separation from God. That's all. And no matter how confident one might be of success, well, I just know I'm going to, it's all right. I had a good attitude about this, and I meant to be doing it to please God, and so many thousands have done it, and how could they possibly be wrong? Well, think of those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Egyptians. And they certainly didn't intend to end up where they ended up, but they did. One is doomed to failure who does not choose to, on God's terms, revealing God's word, 
enjoy by obedience to the truth the abundant life that Christ has to offer, John 10 and verse 10. There's another one. I think it's a fourth one. The separation between God's children and the children of this world, Satan's children, will one day be forever finalized. When we watch the news, you can't watch anything but bad. Everything around us camps on the bad and the ugly and the killings and the scrapes and the robbings and the cheating and the fornication and the, all that kind of thing. Most people wouldn't read a book or watch a program if it didn't have something like that in it. Someday we'll not have to see that anymore. We'll not have to be exposed to it anymore. It won't be there. It'll be in all its own place. So as the children of Israel stood in fear, remember what Moses said. Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. And then he says this, as we read a while ago, for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Let that rest in your mind for a while. Everything that's wicked and bad and rebellious to God, everything that hates God, loves evil, opposes the truth, despises the Bible, despises all things from it, thus the church. We will see them no more. So the day had come when Israel would never again have to fear the Egyptians. These things are written to comfort us as we labor for the Lord in spiritual Israel today and as we fight the fight of faith to lay hold on eternal life. There will also come the day when the faithful child of God when we, the faithful children of God, will no longer have to fear the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vainglory of life, 1 John 2, 16. Because we will have been resurrected from the dead in a glorified body where those things mean nothing. And the snares of the devil will have been forever defeated. The godly and the ungodly when it just put right down to the brass tacks, have nothing in common. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Do we let our minds rest on that? We can see that the moment of death in the Hadean world, when you study what is said about the rich man and Lazarus, that the great gulf is fixed even then, before the world ever ends and before heaven and hell after the judgment comes into existence following the resurrection. So immediately at death, you're separated from all of that that tormented you here. You're away from it. I don't know what all it means when Abraham said to the rich man who was being tormented for the wicked life he lived on earth, Lazarus in his lifetime had his bad things, but now he's comforted. I don't know what I was involved in that word comforting. I, I, I want to know, but there's not enough given. And thou art tormented. Speaking of the rich man. The last point, and then the lesson's yours. We cannot deliver ourselves. The strong arm of God was needed to deliver the children of Israel from the Egyptians. Today and until the end of time and since, since when the Christian age, the church was started, the saving power of God is manifested in Christ Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, John 3, 16. The Bible's clear that when the Lord came, He came to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19, 10. The Bible says that Christ is able to save to the uttermost them that draw near unto God through Him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, Hebrews 7, verse 25. 
Yes, the Israelites' faith had to lead them to obey Moses, the type of Christ. And thus, as you can find throughout the Bible, the faith that saves has always been the faith that obeyed. The Israelites had to obey God and they had to flee the land of Egypt. Today, under Christ, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You haven't obeyed him, you're not saved. I don't care what you think, you're not saved. You're outside of Christ. You're separated from God. If you died right now, you'd be with the rich man. Crying out, no doubt. Send somebody over with his finger dipped in water and touch it to my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. That's what it's going to be. Today, everyone must obey God through Jesus Christ and the gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And the church should not be ashamed of the terms of salvation in the gospel. It's what saved us. The gospel is God's saving power. And we're commissioned as the church to preach it and to defend it and to live it out in our lives. Romans 1.16. Well, it comes down as we close the lesson to this. Will you give up the sins of the world? Will you give up the false doctrine you know is false? Will you have the love of God and the love of the truth to obey it, to live the rest of your life, however long that is, in harmony with it? In other words, while it is called today, will you answer the gospel call? You have now. You don't have an hour from now. You have now. You know you have now. That's all you know, but you know you have now. And thus, that's why at the end of sermons preached by gospel preachers, when you've had people's minds thinking with you and looking into their lives and honestly thinking about their lives, you offer the invitation of Christ. Say, he's always waiting. He's always knocking at your door. But you have to open that door. He will not force the door. And in opening that door, you do so by humbly from the heart believing the truth and complying with the terms of pardon of believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. Then living the Christian life in the church to which he adds you, Acts 2.47. As a child of God, if you sin, you repent of those sins. You confess them. <clears throat> You pray to God for forgiveness. Now, what is your case today? God's searching your heart right now. Can you say right now, I do not believe that baptism does also save us? I just quoted to you what the Holy Spirit said through Peter, who preached the first recorded gospel sermon and said, The believers repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for their remission of sins. Years later, he would say, baptism does also now save us. Save us from what? Our sins. So that he can add us to the church where we can live a righteous life as children of God. Why fight against God? You see where that ends up. When you see Pharaoh and your 600 chariots drowning in the Red Sea. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, will you come while we stand and sing?